All right. Do we have everybody on stage? Are we good to go? Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm seeing so many people enter. This is awesome. Hello and welcome to the 2022, so 2022 Rural Health Equity Conference. My name is Kim Peek and I'll be your host for today. With humility and gratitude, I recognize and acknowledge that I live and learn on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Sioux Nation. We welcome you to share the names of the traditional lands that you gathered on today in the chat box. If you don't know the names of the lands, please visit the website native-land.ca. The link is in the chat box. This biannual Rural Health Equity Conference provides a gathering place for interprofessional learning, networking, and partnership building. The conference features leading research and knowledge translation innovation and has attracted provincial and national interest across a wide range of disciplines and sectors. The goal is to create an interactive, participatory, and creative program that sparks partnerships, enables dialogue, learning, networking, and exchange. We hope you learn lots, feel inspired, and make friends. The event is hosted by the Interior Health Research Department in partnership with the Rural Health Services Research Network of BC and the BC Support Unit Interior Centre. With collaboration among others in Interior Health, other health authorities with rural remote geography, academic institutions, community members and organizations, and also professional bodies. The Rural Health Equity Conference 2022 explores equity and health issues in rural settings, sparking dialogue and connections between people who share a passion for responding to rural and remote communities' unique needs. Offered entirely online on two separate dates, February 14th and 28th, will support reconnection and continued conversation. Presentations will explore strategies for genuine engagement and create dialogue about the implications of research findings for both rural, sorry, rural communities and service organizations. Community action for health equity and relational integrated knowledge translation are the two main themes that guide our program. Many people helped shape this conference and then the reimagining due to a prolonged pause since 2020 when the pandemic started. Although we are not gathered today in person as originally planned, we hope the original intent of both building intersections and meaningful relationships is still at the heart of both days. We thank everyone that has helped shape today and also that thank everyone that is here today. It is truly a great honor to introduce Elder Pamela Barnes, Silk Nation Knowledge Keeper who resides in West Bank First Nations. Elder Pamela, we sincerely thank you for your time today and appreciate your wise words to help us set the tone for all that is to come. Elder Pamela, the virtual microphone is yours. Good morning, everyone. So um, I'd also like to um, introduce my husband, Wilfred Barnes, which he will be doing the um, um, blessing for the day. It's um, my ancestral name is um, Chichuascat, which means the coming of a storm or the coming of change. And it's my honor today um, to welcome you to the traditional territory of the Silks people. And in doing that, I want to just um, share with you a little bit about what that means. And first of all, thank you for the land acknowledgement. And a land acknowledgement um, is just something that everyone should be doing. It is a simple but very important act of recognizing your host. And so just as if the President of the United States were visiting Canada, it would be appropriate for the President to acknowledge Canada as the host. Um, it wouldn't, however, be appropriate for the President of the United States to welcome others to Canada. That would be the role of the Prime Minister or designate. And so it's the same in our traditional territories. So these lands are made up of the blood and the bones of our ancestors for thousands 
and thousands and thousands of years. It's all sacred to us. Here in this part of Turtle Island, we've shared these lands over the last 200 years, where other parts of Turtle Island, that history goes back 500 years, 1,000 years, depending on the location. It's fairly recent here. With the coming of new peoples to these lands have come some new ideas about human relationship to land that is very different than our understanding of human relationship to these lands. We see ourselves as borrowing these lands from future generations. We recognize that any one of us is only here but just a moment in time. And that concept of borrowing is very different than the idea of human ownership of land. And I use this necklace to help um, understand the difference. So if I own this necklace, I can sell it, I can trade it, I can give it away. It's mine. I can do what I want. I can take really good care of it or I can toss it aside. Again, it's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. But the moment that I borrow this, Everything about that relationship changes. I can't sell it. I can't trade it. I can't give it away. It's not mine to do that with. And more importantly, there's an expectation that I take the very best care that I possibly can. And that when I leave it or return it, that it's at least in the same condition that I found it, and if at all possible, better. So it's with this deep understanding of our sacred responsibility to these lands, waters, and all of the life that it contains, that we first welcomed others to our traditional territory. And it's with these understandings that today I welcome you to the traditional, unceded, currently occupied territory of the Sioux people. With the important reminder that none of us including ourselves as Sioux people, are doing a very good job, the best job we can to care for these lands, waters, and all of the life that it contains for all of our children, all of our grandchildren, all of our great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth. So let's all work at doing better. Lem them. Why has it to cost his quest and in and tan fights and can tell Scott Connaught? Tally has his boost can a lot of seek to cost Colin Jutton Gran Wist. Tally has his boost, cool gooch kits gala. Ikal still tell the Kiltimik, Yayat Stim. 
Oi caps timis and kaiils that they will have cool and shoot and kind of waste. Thank you, Creator, for allowing me to say a few words in a little prayer. You know, the things we're going to be talking about today is it's so important to everybody that, <clears throat> that we acknowledge what we're going to be doing today. You know, we start everything out with a little prayer and uh, and uh, <clears throat> And that's how we start things off with, in, in a good way. You know, at this time of year, it, uh, spring is just about here. So, you know, the, the sun is getting stronger and warmer and pretty soon everything's gonna come to life and we will begin going on the land as a uh, seal people. You know, uh, let's get on with what we're gonna do this morning. And let's enjoy each other's company. Limlim, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, sorry, thank you both, Elder Pamela and Elder Wilfred. Your wise words, time, and the prayer. Uh, we sincerely appreciate. We appreciate the relationships that we have. And we welcome you both to stay for today's events, if at all possible, for your schedule. Thank you again. We have welcomed all partners of the conference to say a few words before our keynote session at 9 a.m. The first voice I'm sincerely honored to introduce is Dee Taylor, Corporate Director of IH Research. Dee, the virtual microphone is yours. Thanks, Kim. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday morning. Um, elders Pamela and uh, Wilfred, I, I just wanna thank you again for that uh, beautiful, those beautiful words. As you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the place where I live. Um, so I live rurally uh, in Eagle Bay, which is along the uh, Shushwap Lake in the unceded ancestral territory of the Shwetbek peoples. Um, and as my husband and I were taking a walk yesterday, um, it, it's about this time of year, I start looking for the buds on, on the trees. And my husband and I always have a bit of a fun debate around is that a bud or isn't well i am i am so uh, happy to say that we found the first couple of, of buds very very tiny but we did search them out but your words um about respecting land about knowing that we are guests about leaving it at least uh, in the same state um that we found it in uh, ring really true especially as we see the spring, hope, hope for the spring and start seeing signs of it. So just wanting to send my heartfelt gratitude to you both for that and for reminding us again to ground ourselves for this day. So um, everybody, um, as I said, so I'm, I'm Dee. I have a couple of hats beyond uh, corporate director of research that I'll, I'll bring in to my welcome to you today. One is, of course, as Corporate Director of Research for Interior Health, um, a role that uh, I've been in for about, my goodness, just over seven years I've been with Interior Health uh, connected to research. I also am one of two uh, scientific directors for the Rural Coordination Center of BC, um, going into just past my second year of that. Um, so that ties nicely into some of the conversations we, we are going to have today. I'm also a researcher um, and a community health uh, science researcher. So really curious about communities. Um, and that also I know will be part of our dialogue today. But as I was mentioning at the beginning, I'm also a, a rural a person who lives rurally. And when I think about rural, uh, moved out here three and a half years ago to, to Eagle Bay from West Kelowna uh, in the Silk Territory. And over the years, what I've now understood about rural is it's a, it's a different way of being. Your neighbors are your friends. They are your grocer people. They are your pet sitters, your hairdresser. Um, in my husband's case, they are uh, hockey league um, participants. And how you see people as your neighbors is different. It's connected. How you uh, come together on different um, ideas and initiatives for the community is, is different. 
For example, in Eagle Bay, we're all very excited to know that there's going to be some renovations to our, our local community centre. Uh, so as we come around and think about what that community center holds, uh, the one single building um, in, in our community that is for community. So the conversations about equity and living rurally um, play heavily into my own way of being, uh, not just as a researcher or somebody that works for the health authority or somebody who is dedicated to being part of the solution for um, health and wellness in rural communities but also as somebody who um, is affected and impacted by it. When I think about research, um, it's around curiosity, deep, intense curiosity, and how we think about the questions of research, how we uh, consider how we share those results. And I think today is an excellent way to consider both how we think about those questions and how we think about uh, the knowledge that comes from, from those uh, different community types of research going on. So again, let me welcome you to today. Thank you for participating. Encourage you to, as Kim says, reach out, listen with your whole heart. Um, think about the questions that uh, you have. If you're coming from an urban center and you're curious about rurality, we so appreciate your participation. If you are uh, living rurally all your, your life, and this is something that is well known to you and you offer your wisdom, but also uh, hopefully learn something new from our many excellent presenters today. With that, I think I will hand it back to you, Kim. And again, I'm really excited about this. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Again, sorry, we couldn't be in person, um, but you know, we're, we're learning to be on a community in our own virtual way. So. Welcome everybody, happy Monday, and I'll hand it back to you, Kim. Thank you, Dee. The second partner voice I'm pleased to introduce is Stefan Grzbowski, Director of the Rural Health Services Research Network at BC. Stefan, the virtual microphone is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Kim, for a very uh, elegant uh, orchestration of the introductions and, and I really uh, appreciated uh, the words of, of Pamela and Wilfred Barnes to lead us off. Uh, it, it had, uh, you know, I've listened to a lot of introductions uh, and a lot of welcoming uh, and I, I really uh, was um, moved by what you said, uh, Pamela and Wilfred. Um, I, I live on the, uh, I live uh, rurally on the side of uh, Mount Maxwell on a place known as Salt Spring Island, which is uh, traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, I have tried to sort out which peoples might have lived here over the years, and I'm not certain. And so I don't try and, and uh, illuminate the various uh, branches of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, but the, uh, the recognition that the land that I live on is borrowed from future generations is really a powerful uh, way of seeing uh, the issue of where we live, you know, and, and acknowledging that. Uh, I have uh, I have a 13-year-old son. We're, we're busy preparing for uh, um, the uh, festivity of, of um, Valentine's Day and uh, and it's uh, a real it's really important to recognize how the cycle of life just goes on and how it's related to the land um, and I think that that uh, I really appreciate what the words that you uh, welcomed us with um, the rural health services research network is is an embodiment of the desire to um, strengthen our rural being through relationships and through research, through new knowledge, through looking at the world more closely and understanding it better. Um, the, uh, the magic of relationships and the, the magic of the transformations we need to go through in these difficult times is really what I think uh, this, this, this conference and others like it are, are speaking to. And I, I really appreciate the opportunities to, to support that. I'd like to acknowledge um, <clears throat> the Rural Health Services Research Network, which has been uh, supported by the Rural Coordination Center, 
uh, not the first time that it's come up in this um, this morning, and the Rural Coordination Center is is supported by the Joint Standing Committee, which is a committee of the uh, doctors of BC and the and the Ministry of Health of uh, of our government. So I, I think that uh, um, it's uh, it's a nice embodiment uh, of, of the potential of of when we all work together of getting things done that are moving us in the right direction. Um, so again, I thank you for the opportunity to support this. Thanks. Uh, back to you, Kim. Thank you, Stephanie. Lastly, would be myself on behalf of the BC Support Unit Interior Center. My role is as a research navigator and community facilitator, which means at times I'm a connector, a guide, and I try my best to be a good friend. The Interior Centre is one of five regional centres formed in partnership between a regional health authority and corresponding universities in that region. Roles of the regional centres include building on existing scientific capacity, expertise, infrastructure and connections among health authorities, universities and other organisations in each region. Uh, we link researchers and knowledge users with regional and provincial services. And we also link with each other and with, sorry, with methods clusters across the provincial hubs. Our stakeholders include researchers, patients, healthcare providers, and health system decision makers who are already involved in patient-oriented research or would like to become involved. The Interior Centre has a patient engagement in research committee, also known as PEER, uh, to provide patient partners and researchers with support to increase the ways patients can give their input in research be true partners, and help improve the delivery of health services. Please feel free to email us anytime, research and interiorhealth.ca, and we'll be help, happy to connect to you. And lastly this morning are a few housekeeping items. With five minutes to spare, we're doing great. Uh, we have set today up as a meeting in Zoom to ensure everyone can be heard and seen. Please ensure if you not, do not want to be heard to have your mic turned off. I'm seeing everybody's doing that beautifully, so great job. I am admittedly not as good at this sometimes. If at any time you need to take a stretch or take a break, glass of water, please do so. Take care of yourself. As well, feel free to chat anytime by typing in the text box as a plan B. So uh, if at any time you want to converse and you don't feel like coming off camera, please feel free to use the chat. Please also explore the feed loop, the feed loop platform for speaker bios, session abstracts, and the schedule for both days, so both today and the 28th. We thank you all again for registering and are so thankful that you're here today. So we have four minutes until our keynote session. Um, I'm thinking it might be best for us to take a short break, get ourselves a glass of water and the supplies needed. So for the keynote, you need at least one letter sized sheet of paper, one set of scissors, and a bunch of coloring and writing materials, such as pens, pencils, crayons, pencil crayons, and or felts, whatever you got. Uh, so if you wanna take the next few minutes to, to grab those items, I'll put them in the chat as well. And you know, take a quick stretch. We'll come back together at 9 a.m. and I'll introduce our keynote. Thanks so much again, everybody.
right, welcome back everyone. Okay, so again, make sure for our keynote, just make sure you have on hand one letter size sheet of paper, a set of scissors, and a bunch of coloring and writing material. It is truly an honor and pleasure to introduce the keynote session titled, Wind is Powerful Because It Moves in Many Directions. Thinking and being with Indigenous knowledge holders, the arts, and storytelling in community-informed health research. Speakers for the session are with the Health Arts Research Center and include Sarah DeLue, Research Director, Marian Erickson, Manager, and Laura mcnab Coon, Researcher. Sarah, Marian, and Laura, the virtual floor is yours. Kim, thank you so much. I also want to offer my most um, humble and appreciative thanks to Elder Pamela and Elder Wilford, who I also know as Elder Grouse Barnes. Um, for those of you who don't know, Elders Pam and Grouse do an incredible amount of research and work and grounding for medical students across the province of British Columbia. I've had the honor of watching them bring entire floors of undergraduate medical students to their feet. Pamela, your commitment to reminding us about the need to care for land is a phenomenal reminder every time I see you speak. And to be in the presence of silks in silchen language is a moving and incredible opportunity each and every time I experience it. Thank you so, so much. Kim and all of the rest of the folks who have put so much time and effort into this day, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys have been here as we've asked questions, as, we, as we've worried, and as we've uh, been curious, as V has reminded us is important with research. So Dee, thanks again for also opening us in such a good way with that reminder that curiosity is a powerful, powerful force. Finally, and on a somewhat personal note, folks, Stephen Grzbowski saved my life way back when I was an elementary school student on Haida Gwaii, which is where I grew up. And uh, speaking about relationships and the incredible intimate connections that so many of us living in rural, remote and northern geographies have, I'm here to tell you that without the relationships that you will see unfold today and on the 28th, many of us wouldn't be here. These connections are deep. These connections are important. Indeed, these connections save lives, as Dr. Grzbowski did mine so many years ago. And he knows this. I've bumped into him in many a rural and remote environment and said thanks over time. We really hope today you will leave with a sense, I think, as Elder Pamela and Elder Grouse opened us with, that you'll leave with a sense that stories are some of the most important things that bind us together in relationships and that anchor us on these unceded and violently colonial lands of British Columbia and beyond on which all of our feet are grounded. Wind is powerful because it moves in many directions. And I want to, before we switch to the next slide and get into the guts of the keynote, to read you three lines from a recent book called Bones by the Cree Métis poet, Tyler Pennock. I read this the other day and I had not read it when we thought of the title for this keynote, but I think in so many ways, these few lines of poetry will guide us throughout the rest of the morning. The way the wind pulls a thousand leaves down an empty street, and when they settle, we look up to trace the direction of the wind. I think wind is something that unites us all across the many geographies upon which we stand. And I think we need to look up and know the directions of those winds and understand the way that leaves settle 
and how we might be informed by that. Next slide, please, Lisa. So folks, this is how we hope to proceed for the rest of the day. We're gonna introduce ourselves more formally in about one slide, but while we are introducing ourselves, we hope that you will also participate in a fun little Zoom exercise. It's called a waterfall exercise, and here is the trick to it, folks. We want you to put some things in the chat, but don't hit the return button. Please don't hit the return button until we say, hit the return button, everybody, or hit the enter button. That will allow this streaming waterfall of funny little tidbits to stream in, and you can look at uh, the virtual rooms and the virtual geographies and spaces of the people that you're sharing the afternoon and the morning with. So uh, without hitting Zoom, we're really super curious if uh, you could be a famous villain. Who would it be? We're curious. Villains play such important roles in stories. I have to tell you, um, mine would probably be Cruella de Vil. I, she just terrified me when I was a kid watching Thousand and One Dalmatians, but I kind of loved her lipstick. So full disclosure on that, mine would probably be Cruella de Vil. Also, uh, on the right-hand side of the Zoom chat, you'll see that there's a little opportunity to insert an emoji con. Please insert an emoji con. How are you feeling today? What emoji con best summarizes the emotions and state that you're feeling? I don't know that there's one that fully sort of summarizes COVID exhaustion, but that might be how I'm feeling today. And we would love for you to put any uh, other jots of notes that you're feeling like um, so that your fellow participants and the people that you're gonna be building relationships with across the day have an idea a little bit more about you. Again, we ask you to not hit the return button until we say, hit that enter button. And then this waterfall of all of your colleagues and friends and future research partners and social justice activists will all come flowing in together. Once Marion and Laura and I have introduced ourselves and offered a little bit more of a formal introduction about what we do, we are going to go and undertake a one cut book. Now, thank goodness Marion is gonna lead you through that because I am terrible with scissors and paper and all the rest of it. I just get all confused. Not to worry, Marion is gonna lead you through the most beautiful little creation that you are going to be able to leave with at the end of the day and say, I produced this on February 14th in the company of relationships while discussing the importance of stories to things like rural and remote research. We are going to share some stories with you. We really hope that you will listen beautifully with the stories that uh, we'll be sharing with you. Thank you, Laura and Marion, for those stories. And we're going to create our own stories that fill up the books. We hope that you'll reflect on how these productions of creative work are incredibly important as knowledge dissemination tools, as knowledge method tools, as collection opportunities. If you've got interest in collecting work from participants, if you want to engage in knowledge translation and dissemination, these are the kind of exercises that you might think about doing. So we'll fill in the copies of the books, the pages of the books, we'll listen to stories, and then we're hopefully going to tie this all together so that you can think about how to put it into practice and the incredibly important work of research and practice um, and just being in rural, remote, northern and often overlooked geographies. And we do hope that there might even be the opportunity for you to share this at the end of the day. Next slide, please, Lisa. Terrific. I just want you all to know that I told Marion and Laura that they look so incredibly stunning in this cover slide and I look like a giant nerdy idiot, which makes me feel somewhat uncomfortable. But I couldn't figure out how to change my photograph with my silly little toque on top of it. The toque does say right to remain because I work uh, on the downtown east side in Vancouver, a distinctly not rural northern or remote geographies, uh, geography with folks who are unionizing to stay in single occupancy hotel rooms on the downtown downtown east side. So uh, I thought my toque might say something, but then the circle cut it off. So folks, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah DeLeo. I grew up on Haida Gwaii and I finished school, high school on Tsimtsian territory in Terrace. I saw some folks from Terrace. Hi, please say hi to the Skeena River. I am a poet, a writer, a storyteller. 
And I also hold a Canada Research Chair in Humanities and Health Inequities. I think a lot about overlooked geographies, about the power and hegemonies of coloniality and how it bears down unequally, particularly on Indigenous people's lives and health. And I work at the University of Northern British Columbia in the Northern Medical Program, where we are absolutely committed to producing future physicians of tomorrow who are anchored in, informed by, and located on rural, remote, and northern geographies. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you today from unceded, always occupied Silks territory. I'm standing in my house in Okanagan Centre, but I could just as easily have been in my house in Prince George on Blade Lake Tenet territory, because um, I divide my time between those two places. So with that, Marion, I know that you are in Prince George. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? And we'll go from there. Hello, my name is Marian Erickson. Uh, my mother is Susan Erickson. My father is Lawrence Paul Yaxalatin. Um, and I'm a member of the um, Tamasu clan from, and uh, I'm from Nakesli um, of the Dakaf Nation. Uh, I'm a research manager here at the Health Arts Research Center, as well as a master's of education candidate at uh, Thompson Rivers University. Um, thank you. Uh, Sarah, um, Laura, uh, I'll get pass it on to you. Awesome, thank you, Marianne. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Laura McNabb Coombs. Um, I am a Métis woman um, of mixed descent, English on my mama's side, and Cree and Métis on my dad's side from Treaty Six territory. I was born and raised um, and frequently returned home to the unceded traditional territory of the Sinaiq's peoples. Uh, that's also shared and has overlap with that of the um, Selix, uh, Shwetmik, and Tanaha peoples. Um, I'm currently living here uh, and working and also playing on the um, traditional unceded territories of the Kleetli Tene people of the Dakath Nation. Um, and I work as an Indigenous health research facilitator. Uh, for the Northern Region for the BC NEAR, which is the BC Network Environment for Indigenous Health Research. Um, and I work for a researcher under Dr. Sarah DeLeo and alongside her amazing team at the Health Arts Research Centre. And I am a biomedical sciences student at the University of Northern British Columbia. So yeah, thank you. And I'll just pass it back to you, Sarah. Okay, so not only Laura and Marion are your pictures way more stunning than mine, you guys are also the most amazing humans to work with that I've ever had the honor of working with. That's not besmirching the rest of the amazing people that we work with, but folks who are participating in this conference, you really are in for a treat with Laura and Marion and their generosity of sharing stories with everybody today. I know I'm always amazed and in wonderment when I listen to their stories. So. Now for the fun part, we're just gonna take quick 30 seconds. If you would all hit the enter slash return button with your villains that you'd love to be in stories slash the emojicons of how you're feeling today, hit that return button, open your chat bar and have a look at the incredible, <laughs> yes, Robin Hood. I think Robin Hood was a villain, well done. Biff Tannen. <laughs> Any other? Oh, a coffee cup emojicon. Yes, Erica. Maleficent. Didn't you love Maleficent as well, Laura? Yep, she's up there. Yeah. <laughs> she's up there. <laughs> So folks, please feel free to take a moment and scroll through the chat bar and see everybody's uh, thoughts on, uh, there's lots of Maleficence here. And um, yeah, I like all of the emojicons too. Upside down, happy faces, scratching chins, curiosity. It's terrific. I'm so glad that you are, um, you're joining us with curiosity and with open hearts. We'll continue to let those slide in folks, but next slide, please, Lisa. Okay, a quick and very big placing of today's conversation as you are all placing yourselves in terms of how you're feeling today and if you could be a villain, who would that be? 
In early 2021, so just last year, the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, announced a national commitment to health humanities. And the health humanities, for those of you who don't know, is simply a growing discipline that melds health and medical sciences with things like First Nation studies, philosophy, literary studies, poetry, visual arts, theology, all of those um, disciplines that have broadly been conceived of as the humanities. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Latin of medicine is medicina, which really translates into the art of healing. And many of us in Canada and around the world are arguing that that art, that human aspect of medical sciences, health sciences, health research has been lacking for far too long. We are thrilled, however, that south of the border, uh, all other um, complainings about that geography aside, that south of the border, the American Association of Medical Colleges just announced as follows. The first two decades of the 21st century medicine have witnessed significant transformation in healthcare delivery. We've seen market health disparities, civil unrest, unprecedented rates of physician burnout, suicide, and unforeseen public health crises, the ones that we are situated in today. The AAMC goes on to say, the integration of the arts and humanities into medicine and medical education, and we would argue all realms of health, healthcare, health research, health sciences, the integration of arts and humanities into these realms may be essential to educating a healthcare workforce that can effectively contribute to optimal healthcare outcomes for patients and communities. And I think for those of us who live and work and play and exist in rural, remote and Northern geographies, we know that our stories and that our artful act of surviving are the things that need to be focused on. We know we're not interested in deficit-based research. We want celebrations and we want socially just questions to be asked. There is no such commitment in Canada of the ilk that the AAMC has announced south of, a, uh, south of the border. We argue that that really needs changing. And part of changing that is precisely the sharing of stories and the discussions that we'll be having today. Next slide, please, Lisa. With all of this in mind, and thanks again, Marion, for taking on the role of leading us through some of the arts exercises in one moment. We hope that you will leave with the understanding that complexity is a wonderful thing in health research, that pluralities and messiness is not a bad thing. We hope that you will free yourself into creative ways of producing and thinking about health, healthcare delivery, health research, medical sciences, patient interactions. You will have the honor of listening to Indigenous voices and stories. We hope that you'll understand and learn more about health and medical humanities. And we hope that you might, at the end of this, consider how to put arts and arts into practice and into research in health and medical sciences. And like Kim uh, and Dr. Grzbowski mentioned, we hope that you'll have the chance to have good conversations with each other and have a nice tone and set in a good way the rest of this conference. So with that, Marion, um, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to try to not make terrible errors with my scissors. Would you please lead us in the exercise of our one cut book? Next slide, Lisa. Hey everyone. So I'm going to lead you through making a book. Um, my paper has lines like this. Yours doesn't need that. I'm just just to show you all. Um, so the first thing we need to do is go from short cut side to short side and fold your book. Now open it back up and do long side to long side and fold it evenly there. Um, the next step is we have to make a kind of a gate. So go like this, make it and fold it here and fold it here. So now your paper should look like a gate. Everybody got your gate? 
Erin, for those of us that are idiots like myself, you're looking to have eight equal size squares by folding the edges into the middle. Is that right? Am I doing this right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's on the screen okay. as well, folks. If you're like me and an idiot. Thanks, Marion. Okay. So the next section, we need to make a kind of like a bird. So fold your gate in half here. Okay. Fold your gate in half here. And you should have a shape that looks like a bird or like a witch's hat. So Are people welcome to show what they've done on screen, Marion, in case anybody's getting lost? Not to suggest that any doctors on screen might be slightly type A personalities who are struggling. I'll just pick on you for a second, Stephen. Do you have yours all done and ready? I'm already getting confused. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I think I got it. Is everybody okay? <laughs> Is everybody doing well with theirs? How okay. are you doing, Stephen? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Now this is this step. I want everybody, this is where you need your scissors. You need to cut from here to here. If you did not bring scissors, that is okay. You can very carefully rip it, but just remember, don't rip it all the way. Only rip it from here to here on the, on the spine on both sides. So you'll see how I'm cutting the witch's cat. To the middle. Marian, I love how kind you're being because in our um, practice and runs on this, you said that you were, I was supposed to break the bird's back. Yeah, we didn't get to the bird's back yet. We're breaking okay. the bird's back now. Okay, okay. <laughs> so once you break the bird's back, you should get, sorry, this is how, remember it was a bird? <laughs> now you can break its back. Um, you should be able to get this X shape and then you just fold down the edges here and then you can close up and make your book. Did that go well for everybody? Okay, if you have done well and created your book, um, start making page numbers on each one, uh, number one, like right from the front. Um, so make sure your, your book has page numbers because this is going to help in our presentation. Can Just I get so that everybody knows everybody's doing okay with this? In the past, we've um, got everybody to turn their cameras on and hold their little books up so that we can take screenshots because we love you so much now that you have a book. Is everybody feeling feeling oh Amanda yes Amanda hey everybody go Jordy, for yay <laughs> great I'm glad everybody did well with this I hope that was simple enough um all right next slide um so for the front covers of your book um I'm going to go through my speech, but while I'm saying this, um, I just want to let you know that the story that I'm going to tell has never been illustrated before. So you can illustrate the story that I'm about to tell, or you can illustrate your own story on the, on the front and back of your book covers. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I am a master's student at Thompson Rivers University, um, where I'm writing my master's thesis. And I thought I'd just start by, um, by introducing my literature review. My master's thesis is um, on revitalizing DACF's midwifery um, practice by developing a DACF doula training program or a birth worker training program. Um, so um, I thought I'd just share a little excerpt from my literature review. Um, I have thought for a long time about writing a literature review for this research. I considered a de decolonizing a scoping methodology and other forms of decolonizing work. Though upon reading, I found that these methods might take a bit of time to develop and may even require that I do a PhD on these topics to truly make them effective. I then thought about the birth of my second child. This birth was a C-section due to my baby being so big. The C-section was a very 
Western experience for me. I was in an unfamiliar place in an all white circular feeling room surrounded by doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, and other healthcare practitioners. I was instructed to speak up if I was feeling any pain or discomfort. Once the surgery was completed, Dr. Odulio explained that this surgery was a success and I left with a very big and healthy baby. My baby's name was not easily pronounced by the settlers who helped bring him into this world, though he was healthy and I was happy. And so to begin this literature review, I will first begin by expressing that some of the feelings of being in an unfamiliar and unfamiliar and Western place are once again washing over me. Though at this point, I will be trusting the many scholars before me who have done this procedure before. I will engage and conduct this literature review with an open heart and open mind. Though I may at times think deeply about this process by critically reflecting on and explaining feelings of pain and or discomfort. Um, I recently submitted this proposal for review and my uh, one of my um, committee members said, do you have permission to use Dr. Odulio's name? And I'm like, no, she cut a child out of me. <laughs> We're connected forever. <laughs> so I'm allowed to use her name in my, in my thesis. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I thought today it would be, if you haven't had coffee, this might really wake you up. This is a story about a midwife um, who killed her daughter. Um, and this is included in the, the legends uh, collected by um, Lily and Sam in the book entitled Nakesli Pene Yastak, Nakesli Elders Speak. Um, so there was a woman who was pregnant and she went up to the mountains with her husband. Her husband asked his mother-in-law to accompany them on their trip so she could be a midwife when the baby came to be born. Before they went to bed, they would tie up all the dogs near the camp. The old woman would sleep on the outside. The husband used to go ahead to search for a place for the next camp and he would tell them where to set camp, telling them to sleep there, saying he would meet them later. The young girl and the mother packed up their belongings for the camp. When they finished, the old woman asked her daughter, can I look for lice on your head? Her daughter replied, I have no lice. How are you going to find lice on me? Her daughter grabbed her by the hair, pushed her down, carried she carried a piece of pick made of bone and by poking her in her ears, she killed her daughter. Her body went limp and she fell to the ground. Her own daughter and she was expecting. The old woman took up all the packs and changed her clothes into her daughter's clothes and packed them all up the mountain. The reason why she killed her daughter was because every night while the old woman slept, someone came and slept with her. She thought that it was her son-in-law that slept with her. It turned out that it was a bad spirit. She covered her daughter's body with spruce boughs and left her behind. The old woman gathered up the packs and headed up to camp. She hurriedly made the camp and waited for her son-in-law to come back, disguised as her daughter. She got away with it for a while until after dinner when she was going to bed. Um, as they got ready for bed, he went to lay down with his wife. It was then that he noticed that he was sleeping with his mother-in-law. He immediately got up and headed back to the last campsite. When he got there, he looked all over for his wife. He looked for her and found her body underneath spruce boughs. He placed his hands on her stomach and found there was still movement. The baby was still alive. He opened her stomach, removed the baby, and wrapped the baby up good. He fixed up his wife and put her to rest. She is a wicked woman, he said, as he headed back to where the old woman was. When, he, when she saw him, she said to him, give me the baby, I'll care for it for you. Yes, you will care for it, you will raise it. In anger, he bashed her head in and killed her. And just before he did this, he asked, why did you kill my wife? Why did you do that? She cried, why did you sleep with me? And he left the old woman lying there and headed back to the village. He told his relatives and the relatives of the old woman about what he had done. Also what he had done with the old woman. The relatives told him she had it coming to her. 
When the father was packing the baby on his back, the baby kept sucking on his neck. All of a sudden, the baby sucked the tongue out of his father. His father collapsed and died. Then the baby did that to all of the people and also the dogs. He sucked their tongues out. Finally, someone got a hold of the baby and threw him in the fire and burned him alive. When they were holding him down with the stick in the fire, he kept shouting, my fellow mosquitoes, kill the people. He kept repeating this over and over and over again until he died. They got a hold of the tongues and put the tongues back on the dead people. The people came alive and some of the people's tongues were replaced with dog's tongues. These are the people who stutter, the persons that can hardly talk. And from now on, when you hear a mosquito, it sounds like a baby crying in the distance. It's also the story of the first um, C-section in Dakath territory and um, probably says a lot about why my ancestors never um, conducted C-sections <laughs> normally. <laughs> Um, I thought that was a really great story about a midwife. Um, uh, just to wrap things up uh, for myself, um, I was reading Marie Baptiste, a Mi'kmaq educator from the Potomac First Nation states. Um, the traditional Eurocentric view of Indigenous peoples and their heritage as exotic objects that have nothing to do with science and progress is over. This prejudicial view will now have to compete with, in, with international law. Um, as the province of BC works towards um, implementing UNDRIP, I think it's important to consider that Indigenous people have the right to, without discrimination, to the improvement of their economic social conditions, including inter alia in areas of education, employment, vocational training, and retraining. Um, and um, as the province of British Columbia works towards fully implement, implementing UNDRIP, um, Indigenous um, people must consider the wisdoms and traditions of Indigenous knowledge in, in education. Um, so uh, with that, I, I, I'm looking forward to completing my master's thesis and implementing a new vocational training program for my own people. Um, through the work that we're doing both at HARC and at um, and and uh, in my studies at Thompson Rivers University, um, and I will pass. Sorry, um, we'll go to the next slide. So this story, I'm sorry. I before sharing, I should have mentioned this story um, was shared in this book by uh, Elder Sarah Prince, who was born on November 22nd in 1903. Um, at what's now, what's at Cezailia, now called Colony Point uh, in Nakesley. And there's a picture of her um, sitting there. Uh, next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Marion. Thank you so much. Every time I hear that story, my head explodes 57,000 times. Um, this was me illustrating the front and back cover of my book uh, while my head was exploding. Um, one of the things that you've talked to me about um, is how that story links with contemporary scientific medical knowledge oh, about right. <laughs> that. Do you, do you want to tell us that? Because that also sure. goes away. I mean, I'm taken with the burning babies and the killings and the spruce boughs, <laughs> but there's an incredible underlying scientific knowledge to that story as well. Is that right? Yeah, I was actually looking it up um, and um, I was like, well, does this have anything to do with today? So I actually looked up uh, the if there's a link between C-sections and um, and uh, and speech uh, delays or speech impediments and stuff like that, and there is actually um, an increased uh, chance of speech delays in in uh, in babies who are born of C-section. So I thought that that was really interesting information uh, to include with this story, and I think it'll be something that I include in my uh, uh, doula training program. Um, because doulas actually decrease the amount of um, C-sections when they uh, work with uh, women. 
So I thought that that was really interesting. Um, having access to medical journals is pretty delighting when I'm able to compare it with uh, or kind of bring together uh, Indigenous and, and um, Western knowledge. Yeah, I, um, when the first time you shared that story, um, first of all, I had to ask for you to share it about 60,000 other times because I was like, okay, hold on, really? Like sh tongues of dogs back into people and babies and the screaming of mosquitoes in the background. I was like, oh, my Dutch lily white ancestry, just my head can't handle this. But um, I love how much knowledge is embedded in that story. And to be perfectly honest, Marion, every time I listen to it and listen to you, I feel as though my understanding of the world gets just that little bit bigger. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to turn their camera on and uh, share the uh, cover and back of their book that you've been illustrating to either illustrate Marion's story or to illustrate a story of your own that has never been shared, please feel free to turn your cameras on and, and show it. Um, and we are going to, if you don't want to, that's fine. I'm not even going to pick on you, Stephen. Um, even though I imagine that uh, as somebody who has great interest in uh, midwifery and birthing practices in northern rural and remote geographies, you got a lot out of this uh, presentation and story of Marian's. We're going to now make some art from the unexpected. And again, I hope that you keep in mind how it is that knowledge and research and translation and dissemination and social justice and practice in often overlooked geographies can come about beautifully when we are least expecting it. That's going to be our task for page three to six of your book. So you've just illustrated the front cover and the back cover. Now what you're going to do is open your book you're going to leave page two blank. That is Laura's domain. She is going to guide you through page two. And you're going to go to page three of the book. Next slide, please, Lisa. Okay. 30 seconds. Folks, don't think too long about this. That is not the exercise. On page three, write in great, big, colorful, wonderful letters a word that is a noun that holds deep importance to you. Baby, daughter, home, parent, rural, community, research, any word that holds great importance to you. And I'm looking at the clock beside me, the one that drives my students crazy when I forget to hit the mute button. Any word, here's what I'm going to write. Some of you might write mosquito now that uh, Marion's story is deeply embedded in your brain or tongue. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Don't think too much about this. It should be from the gut, from the heart. A word, best a noun that is representative of something deeply important to you. When I'm working with poets, they all choose crow for some reason. Poets love crows. So any word, that holds deep importance to you. Okay, I'm gonna trust that y'all have that down on page three. And now I want you to turn to page four and five. So those middle pages of your book. We're gonna give you four minutes for this next exercise. Slide, Lisa. Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna turn off my camera. We're gonna mute. I want you to come up with as many descriptors related to that word as you possibly can. So for instance, if you were in one of my writing classes and you chose crow, you would say wing, black, wire, bird, sad, frightened, cat, fly, car, city, feather, pest, smart, kind, all nest. If you chose mosquito, because it's embedded in your uh, head from Marion's story, any word about mosquito, annoying, tongue, blood, uh, water, every word that you possibly can. Folks, if you can get a hundred words onto these middle pages, 
I will send you a book of poetry. You will give me your mailing address and I will send you that book of poetry. 100 words, as many as you can. It's 940 right now. We're going to stop at 944. Everybody, cameras off, heads down, as many words as you can. We got about 30 seconds left, folks. Okay. Did anybody get 100 words out into their middle pages? Anybody? Anybody get more than 50 words out onto their pages? Feel free to unmute yourself, stick your camera on. Anybody get loads of words? Okay, I'm just gonna go down, 33 words. Marianne, stop showing off. God, you're brilliant at 6,000 different levels. Kim Peek, okay, how many did you get? And Katrina Plamondon. I, I got about, uh, I'm going to guess 40. I was really trying for 100, Sarah. I wanted your poem. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Katrina, how many did you get out? Uh, about 48. One's anybody, a three. <laughs> okay, anybody get more than 48? Julie, 38? Anybody get more than 48? You guys, there's a book of poetry on the line here. I'll mail it in the mail to you. Katrina, if it's you got, that got the most of our 69 participants, I will deliver a work of poetry to you in person. <laughs>
Anybody get more than 48 words? Katrina, I think you've won yourself a book of poetry. Done, it's yours. Okay, next slide. Wait, actually don't put it on just yet. You guys, this is the part where you all dislike me and you all feel uncomfortable. And then you realize that out of remarkably unexpected and uncertain and confusing and unexpected spaces comes real beauty. So before we put up our next slide, so just hold on, Lisa, turn to page six in your book and right at the top of that page, that noun that means so much to you. So I've gone from the single big word to my 48 plus words to putting that word that's very important to you at the top of page six in your book. And we're going to do another writing exercise for four minutes. Next slide, please, Lisa. Four minutes, guys. I want you to write a description or a ditty, a poem, a paragraph about that word that is so important to you. And you're not allowed to use any of the words that you just brainstormed. Katrina, you can feel irritated with me now. All of those amazing words. I'm taking them away from you, and I'm asking you to create something unexpected and beautiful in a brand new fashion. We'll mute and come back on in four minutes, folks. Four minutes. So feel free to try to create something, and I guarantee you this is going to surprise you. It's even more beautiful than you might have created with those expected words. Again, we'll just mute and we'll come back on at 9.51.
we got about 30 seconds more, folks. Okay, feel free to put down your writing utensils, your writing implements, your pens and your pencils. And next slide, Lisa. I hope what you've all just learned is that sometimes we see our work, we see the world through routine. We see it in a certain way because we expect those to see the world in that way. We have certain languages and words that provide the lens and the descriptors for what we do and how we think. And that those words and ideas can sometimes become entrenched. It's sort of what happens when somebody from a big city moves to a rural, remote, or northern geography. Suddenly all their words are lost. Their frames of reference don't make any sense. They need to be popped out of their, their trenches. Ultimately, and Dee, I think you alluded to this in a, little, in a little way, that something miraculous can come from being thrown out of what we know. And it can be so important to hit that refresh button, that beauty and that knowledge comes from the unknown and the unexpected. And our team is here to try to instill an understanding that the arts and humanities can help us with this in realms of health and medical and healthcare research. Now that my dog has started to bark, it seems like the perfect time to hand this presentation off to Laura. Laura, I'm gonna mute then I might go reprimand the dog. I know you have a dog. I'm sure your dog's not going to be a bother like mine is. Can you take it away, Laura? Absolutely, Sarah. Thank you. And also my dog is worse, so you're good. I had her removed from the house prior to this. <laughs> I should have had mine removed. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much again, everyone. And thank you, Sarah, for passing that off. Um, we're going to start actually with adding to that book again. I know we're making you do so much artwork and, and creative thinking. Um, and I'd like you to grab your book and we're going to start on, on page number two. And the stories that I'm going to share with you later are relevant to this. Uh, they touch on themes of complexity and identity. So I'm hoping we can kind of prime you with that for this exercise. Um, so we've located page number two, hopefully. So again, that's the little page right on the inside. I'm covering my word uh, for fear of judgment <laughs> for by now. <laughs> Uh, so the one I'm right on the inside. Um, and to begin, I actually would like you to close your eyes. And I've got my phone I'll use as my little timer. Um, and I'll let you know when we start. But you're going to place your pen or pencil somewhere on that page, number two. Um, and I'd like you to start thinking about a time in your life, um, whether it be in a personal or professional um, environment, where you've experienced feelings of tenseness, of complexity, um, and be it as a result of um, an interaction with someone else or just how you were made to feel in a certain environment um, and where these feelings of complexity um, and tenseness could have stood in the way of like your true feelings and, and how you would feel oriented to a situation um, where maybe your beliefs or, or who you were were made to feel invalid. So I'm going to get the timer started and we've got about a minute here. So while you're reflecting on that time, um, I'd like you to use your pen and pencil to make um, marks on your page that will reflect or, or get out any feelings of, of tenseness and, and discomfort you may have. And maybe this is going to happen through your dotting, um, you're doing aggressive markings, trying to fill up that second page. And remember to keep your eyes closed, no cheating. Um, really let those feelings guide your hand in those markings. And maybe you're pressing hard on the page or maybe you stay soft with a neutral amount of pressure. But really trying to envision how you felt um, and reflect on that. We've got about 15 more seconds to fill up that page and push those feelings of tension, discomfort out onto that paper. 
All right, so great job. If you wanna finish up, thank you so much for participating. And I'm sorry, I made you think of an uncomfortable time. <laughs> so if you could push that um, paper aside, you can just put that there because we're gonna attack the last page, page number seven, um, when I'm done this. So everyone, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna share with you about my experiences as a student in biomedicine and working in health and wellness research over the last uh, three years specifically, and how these have changed me as a person, um, as one would probably expect it would. And in many ways, it's changed me for the better. Um, but more recently, I've come to this realization that it's affected me in an unexpected way that may not necessarily be positive. Um, yeah, and I wanna reflect about that here. So when I was originally planning for this wor workshop specifically, um, putting together content, I was going to talk to you about plurality in medicine, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with in, in terms of specifically looking at how both healthcare practitioners and healthcare users must navigate through this healthcare system that is heavily influenced, dare I say, what is created out of um, Western science and Western biomedicine. And yet simultaneously there exists within this um, system, both medical practitioners and users who come into med uh, medicine or um, into these environments seeking healthcare with differing epistemologies, um, so worldviews, um, and some of these are strikingly different. And one's worldview typically influences how, you know, it's perceived that medicine, medicine should be practiced, um, how a patient perceives a healthcare experience they've just had, um, and ultimately their willingness to, to follow healthcare recommendations, be it a prescription, um, disease preventing behaviors, etc. And I had wanted to talk about my own orientation to this on the basis of me being um, of mixed ancestry and how I am um, at times influenced by two very uh, different perspectives in terms of life and worldviews um, as I navigate the Canadian health uh, healthcare system and the research environment. So I instantly had felt this need to validate my life experiences um, through or with findings from the literature. That was just instinctive. Um, I did not go in this kind of storytelling mode. And I, I had that feeling, especially knowing that I would be presenting this to people who are either healthcare um, and wellness pro professionals or scholars. Um, all of you who most likely have much more experience and knowledge than I. Um, and this was challenging. And so while talking with my colleague, actually Marion, who's here with us, um, for guidance as to how to refine some of the ideas I had, I, I blurted out in frustration, honestly, I think Western science has ruined my brain. Um, and I want to clarify, I didn't mean that I hate Western science or biomedicine. Um, I don't think it's invalid or unimportant. And I don't want to villainize biomedicine in any way. I actually chose biomedicine, right, for my undergraduate um, it's saved my life, it's saved the lives of those I love, and has done remarkable things for medicine, realistically. What it is that I'm here to reflect on is that throughout my undergraduate career, um, biomedicine has told me that my experiences, thoughts, and opinions are really valueless, if not validated by um, literature or supported by it in some capacity. And um, I've kind of realized that this, this experience and, and the concept of biomedicine, it's fundamentally opposite um, of what I've been taught growing up. It opposes how I was raised, um, how I was taught to orient myself to this world, um, all of which I learned through storytelling in some form. And these stories um, often contain or literally were anecdotes. They're stories from my ancestors, from those who came before me, um, and they guide me on how I, I should walk through this world. And as a mixed person, I struggle to find that balance with my own identity at times too. Um, I'm connected to my Korean Métis ancestry through my father and his family. And when my mama had me, she went back to work within a month or so of birth. And my dad was this awesome stay-at-home dad. Uh, essentially, from the day I was born until around five, I was connected to him at the hip, like, quite literally. Um, my mom always tells me of how he would walk around with me on his hip, like a baby bottle in the back pocket of his jeans, because he always wore jeans and cowboy boots. Not sure what was up with that. <laughs> always. <laughs> um, and yeah, I would just go with him everywhere. And he taught me a lot about who I was and where I came from at a really early age. Um, back in the Kootenays and trail, there's this water tower up by the side of my family's house. And I just remember being buckled in the backseat of like 
this old car, um, riding these bumpy back trails, driving out to isolated areas where he'd do target practice. Um, and I enjoyed those times so much. And despite being so young, I think I actually learned to find like this calmness in the sound of his rifle going off, which might be disturbing, but also is just the reality of that early imprinting. Hey, and we'd stay out there and we'd snack in the bush. And he'd tell me stories about his younger days, the adventures he's had, he'd have. And, um, through these stories, I learned to love the land and, and, and I just learned about who I am and, and where I come from. And, um, his, his influence shaped who I was, but around age five, um, he relapsed with an old heroin addiction uh, that this time he could not beat. And as the years passed, like that unshakable bond, you know, disintegrated. Um, but I was really fortunate because I had my auntie, his sister, um, who was really connected to our culture, who married a Mayan medicine man from Guatemala. His name is Andres Lish Lopez. And I just think of him fondly because he's a really fun guy. <laughs> And um, my mom would send me out there for weeks during the summer, out there being Vancouver, um, Coast Salish territory, to get away from my dad and to be with them. And um, my grandma lived in the Cooties as well, so she'd come back and visit a lot. So I had this really great person um, and this safe space where I could maintain that access to my culture. Um, and I remember asking her one day, why doesn't grandma look like us? Um, and why she had never taught me these things that like you and dad did. And my grandfather had passed by this time. Um, and she told me because it wasn't back in the day, like it wasn't good to be who we are. And to clarify, my grandfather, my grandmother is 103 years ago. So like she's seen a lot and been through a lot as had her family. Um, and so to, you know, her, even though her father, um, my great grandfather and my great grandmother were very involved. And my father, my great grandfather was actually a Cree translator. Um, they kind of disconnected at that generation, but my dad and my auntie, when they were in their twenties, had this really great opportunity to go out, um, and, and connect themselves with like my grand, my great grandfather and my great grandmother. So that being said, it was a really weird kind of interface where, again, I'm this mixed person and, you know, you hear about these things being really shameful and you see this directly in a, a generation. And then you have another generation that's like all for it and going, um, yeah, so it was it was pretty wild. And so from early on, you know, I I had this thing where that where there's something about me that I was going to carry that probably had complications with it. Um, but that I was also really privileged in some ways. So I went uh and entered academe <laughs> and the pursuit of biomedicine. And I had been I had sat in these classes where, you know, I'm taught to think analytically which is great. And, um, I loved that, but also way less relationally. And it's the least I could say is it's been strange, um, to hear that, you know, medicines from my family aren't considered valid, like using bark from maple trees, um, the tea for different practices using, um, strawberry tea for like gastrointestinal, all these things because they hadn't gone through this really rigorous um, clinical trial. You know, we didn't, there was no placebo, there's no controls for all of these things that we have in place. Um, and so it kind of felt embarrassing at times to hear, or it felt like I was hearing, I should say that these stories and lessons I had learned weren't valid. Um, I also had papers early in my academic career um, sent back with comments such as like, is this a factor opinion? There felt like there was no space. Um, to create relationship to things. And I know that this, there are time and a place for stories, right? Like, for example, if we don't like the look of a chemotherapy drug, you know, somebody didn't like it. Um, this isn't where those stories are the most important or, or valid because, you know, we're fighting, we're developing these anti-cancer drugs to um, combat these, this really sinister collection of diseases. We want them to be um, effective um, we want them to do their job and not be pushed aside, perhaps because of a specific story, but um, to refuse stories of the experience of chemotherapy patients and, and how it felt and it's impacted their lives, that's kind of where that problem lies. Um, and I think there's a need for multiple ways of knowing and being. Um, so I've had this battle at times where, you know, I respect scientific method. Um, while also trying to remember the values in these lessons and stories that I've been told myself that haven't gone through rigorous peer review. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I think sometimes um, it has felt like a sense of loss and that biomedicine has um, ruined my brain. Um, but I think that's why the work that we're all doing and that I've seen Dr. DeLeo do um, at the Health Arts Research Center is so important and it's, it's truly urgent. Um, and same with that, like, patient plan, um, patient focused, I'm doing a conference on that later. Like, it's just, it's really important to see. And it's been a super interesting experience. Um, I'm lucky because for the most part, I've been able to reconcile some of those feelings. Um, and I have been able to navigate. Um, I've got great elders, people who support me, um, mentors. And I just want to share you a quick story about one um, who is a ferocious, and I say that in a positive way, woman. <laughs> positive way. Um, so it's about two, three years ago, I was seeking advice um, from Indigenous scholars and healthcare workers for guidance on some research I had been interested in um, pursuing. And this really amazing conversation arose. Um, I was actually nervous calling this woman. Her name is Coco Miller. She is this fierce Shimshan woman um, from the Terrace region. She's gorgeous. She works as both a patient advocate in the FNHA, like supporting Indigenous patients in this interesting healthcare system. Uh, but she's a firefighter. Like she's just this wild, diverse woman. Um, yeah. And it, it's just really great that she was willing to talk to me, like, especially since we know like research has done so much harm to Indigenous peoples historically. And I would even say today. Um, but despite giving her like a cold call email, she was like, hey, let's talk. Um, and I was expecting like when I kind of brought up some of the ideas to maybe be shut down. Um, I felt my blood pressure rise as the phone rang. I was definitely nervous, got some little nervous sweats going on. And she answered. And I just remember taking this huge breath, being like, hey, my name is Laura, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I sometimes get nervous when I say I'm Métis because there can be tension out there and it can be a little political. Um, and she just took the steering wheel. She drove me through this fantastic conversation. I grabbed my ugly little yellow notepad and was writing down notes like a madman. Um, and I was like, wow, I need to keep track of everything she's saying because this is crazy amazing um and then the conversation you know takes its natural course everything discussion about like my research plans blah 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 wanting to be a healthcare practitioner and then she kind of interjects in a way and is like you know what you are what people like you are and I said no and <laughs> clearly had like a oh darn is this going to change directions um am I going to be ugly crying when I get off the phone with this woman um and she said to me you're what we call a bridger and some, that's someone who walks in both worlds, per, as per her definition, um, and whose work can be used to bridge us together, us being settlers and, and, and Indigenous people, you know, because I, I do, I walk in these, both of these worlds at all times. And it was profound. It was profound in that I've worked my entire life to balance my own experiences coming from these two different um, worlds. As I said with you, like I've had these weird kind of tensions in identity. Um, ultimately hoping like that by the end of my journey, I can make positive change in the work that I do and, and in my future professions. And having someone who works intimately within that system say something like that was so validating. Um, and I won't lie, at times like academe can be really, really intimidating still. Um, and it's an intimidating concept, um, but I can reconnect to this. And I can think about that. And it kind of helps ground me in that idea of like, I can carry these parts of me, but also function in this, um, this different realm. And these stories are still valid. And, and yeah, it's intimidating at times to be told you're a bridger, because I think it puts, I put pressure on myself to really want to do the best that I can um, and probably cause myself unnecessary stress <laughs> at times. Um, but I try not to take up the space from those voices and stories who um, may be more relevant um, and maybe more important, giving the context. And and it is just this positive thing for me. So this is what mess intention looks like and feels like in the body of a Métis woman trying to pursue medicine, or at least my body trying to pursue a career in medicine and, and thrive in health and wellness research. Um, and again, like, it's really great to know that when I sit in those feelings of awkwardness or tension or feeling like maybe I don't belong or get severe, severe, severe imposter syndrome. Um, and at times when that narrative of Western medicine might make me feel like I'm forgetting some of those stories, um, I, I have this thing to look at this interaction with this great mentor um, that helps me ground myself. So, and it allows me to function within Bayer medicine or think that I can while honoring my uh, traditional teachings. 
So thank you so much for listening to my rambling story <laughs> for shared overshared information with you likely. Um, I want to leave you with a sense of that while tension and conflicting messages and pressure from biosense uh, biomedicine are, um, and bioscience are constantly there. Um, I take great comfort and calm in knowing that I can bring a bridging perspective. Um, so moving into this final page here on our little backside number seven. Thank you for the slides, Lisa, intuitively, because I definitely am not doing great at that. Um, we're gonna do that exercise again, um, but we're gonna do it in a slightly different way. So we're gonna go into this um, reflecting on a time when you felt a great sense of calmness in yourself, um, where you felt you were doing work, that you felt good, doing that you felt like you were doing a sense of good where you felt you were coming together in this world um, and could exist as you are in that environment. Um, so if you want to do markings or draw an image um, from something that kind of reflects that, be it something in the room, um, I invite you to do so. So if we could close our eyes, um, put our pen on that page and we'll do a blind contour, I guess, or those blind markings again. Um, go ahead and I'll just put the timer on again. We'll do that for about a minute. So again, just kind of to reiterate, um, reflecting on those times, right? That calmness, I think the resolution of, of tension and, and awkwardness and discomfort. Um, yeah, and where you felt strong and, and grounded in who you were and the work that you were doing. Got about 30 seconds. Again, thank you for all of the immense amount of artwork you've done <laughs> today. We've got that last 10 seconds just to kind of finish that up. And when you're ready, can open your eyes, put that pen down and um, push aside. And I would love to thank you actually first for doing that and, and listening and partaking of this. And I, I'd like to pass it over to Sarah. Laura, thank you so much. Um, as we've worked through this presentation, I've been humbled beyond words at your willingness to be vulnerable and authentic and to name how it is that messiness and tension can be simultaneously beautiful, painful, and remarkably generative and productive. And I think you have um, demonstrated that and lived that and shared that in an incredible story. So thank you uh, so much. You can see in the chat, um, I'm not alone in my thankfulness. What I'm gonna do for the next literally one to two minutes, leaving us 15 or so minutes for conversation and sharing of books, is I'm going to try to be that lit review, be that bioscience framing and modality that both Laura and Marion so beautifully unsettled and um, questioned, because it deserves questioning because coloniality should not be as overarchingly powerful and as aggressive and violent as it is. And we think that the arts and humanities have some force in unstabilizing that. So next slide, I'm just going to briefly introduce you to a concept called narrative medicine. And I'm going to leave it to you to all go Google that. Just Google it. Suffice it to say that narrative medicine incorporates stories and the kinds of learnings that we've just done today in its realm of looking to humanize and to demedicalize medicine. Please feel free to think about narrative medicine for professional development workshops, for research possibilities, and in your own production of social justice and production of knowledge. Narrative medicine, the ilk of what we've just uh, listened to today with the stories that have been shared, can really foster positive relationships. It can create new and innovative communication strategies for patient-centered care. It can, through close reading or close listening, 
increase our accuracy and our scope of knowledge. I hope today everybody's knowledge has been uh, increased and it can increase perceptual sharpness and ultimately listening to and reading and sharing stories and narratives can assist in these times when burnout and exhaustion is so high. It can be remarkably therapeutic to share and to listen to stories of the ilk that we've just done today. Next slide, please. I want to thank Lisa Boyvin, with whom Marion and Laura and everybody at the Health Arts Research Centre have wonderfully enjoyed working with over the years. I know Lisa quite well. Um, we have paid honorariums for the privilege of using her art. She's a Dene artist and scholar finishing her PhD at the University of Toronto. So I think that Lisa's incredible image, the art of healthcare is perfectly encapsulated in these multiple worlds coming together to share and, as Laura has said, bridge knowledges to come out stronger at the other end. And we hope that you will have at least been given some kind of a glimpse into how critical health humanities, the ilk of what we've just demonstrated today, can help us listen more genuinely to diverse voices how it can encourage our own self-reflection so that we can more deeply understand ourselves in our worlds, including our worlds of rural, remote, health equity-seeking research, practice, and action. It can help the ingestion of other worldviews. We hope that the stories that Laura and Marion have shared today have been ingested as you've been producing art that we can open new spaces for reflection and contemplation, which is something that's so important when we're undertaking work about health equity and in rural, remote, northern, overlooked, marginalized, vulnerabilized communities and places. And that ultimately it can be a space for translation. It can be a space where we all come together as we have this morning, as I know you will throughout the days and weeks and hours of this conference. Next slide. These skills are remarkably important folks. They are remarkably important in a time when the In Plain Sight report has demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that there is ongoing systemic racism in the healthcare system. When the truth and reconciliation calls to action have demanded that we think and be and practice differently. The arts and the humanities can, I think we might be able to agree, intersect with the in plain sight, the in plain sight reports demand for refreshed approaches to anti-racism, cultural humility, and trauma-informed training for healthcare workers. We hope that these sharings of stories have offered you just that, that refreshed approach that understanding that we can't always just use the same old, same old words to frame our thoughts and our actions. And we hope that the arts and humanities might speak volumes to the demand and the call to action number 23 by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to provide cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals. And I would argue health, medicine, researchers, practitioners, professionals, and researchers the kind that this virtual space is filled with today. So I want to, and I know Laura and Marion uh, are thanking you as well. I also want to acknowledge Lisa Strigler in the background with whom Marion and I have the privilege of working. Lisa is the woman advancing the slides as Laura, Marion, and I say, next slide, please. So Lisa, thanks. But most importantly, thanks to each and every one of you who have attended today um, and who hopefully will leave thinking that yes, arts, humanities, story, creative production, these have important roles to play in knowledge translation, knowledge dissemination, knowledge creation, and in our practices and in our quests and journeys for a better world. We're at 1020. That leaves us 10 minutes to show off our books, to read poetry, to share our own stories, or to do anything else that we do so desire. Lisa, thanks for putting that last slide up. 
please have a visit at the Health Arts Research Centre, healtharts.ca. Loads of interesting arts-based work that uh, are all free. You're welcome to download. You're welcome to uh, peruse at uh, your leisure. And if we want to take the slides down and open our beautiful virtual room, people are free to put their cameras on, share uh, their illustrations of dog tongues in people and the multiple worldviews that I know all of you have and live. Thank you very, very much. Laura and Marion, did I miss anything? I don't think so. <laughs> All right, you guys were amazing. Okay, feel free to turn your cameras on folks and uh, share away if you do so desire. Kim, perhaps we'll let you um, sort of field, uh, read, um, read uh, things in the chat, uh, don't have the camera, no problem CJ. Oh my God, <laughs> there's the most beautiful poem in the chat bar. CJ, thank you so much. Um, and I'll mute Kim if you want to uh, guide us through the next 10 minutes of sharing or nine minutes of sharing. I'll let you keep us on track as we move toward a break. Sounds great. Thank you, Sarah, Laura, and Marion. Uh, please feel free to, to write the chat or feel free to share your camera. And you're welcome to unmute as well if there's anything that you would like to say to the the keynote panel today. And Chris, I agree, that's a lovely poem. Thanks, Chris. Sorry to have called you CJ, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chris. Your name was uh, erased in the top bar. Feel free to, um, Pamela, thank you so much. Um, yeah, feel free to, um, to drop things in the chat bar, or again, you're very welcome to turn on your camera. We especially asked for this to be an environment where everybody could be seen um, and have the power over your cameras. Amanda, are you interested in, in sharing it all? You're muted, Amanda. You, you're, you're gonna wanna hit that microphone, Amanda so that you're not muted. Oh, Amanda says that her mic isn't working, but she looks okay. like she's showing her book. Okay. It's, oh my God, it's beautiful. The first time I tried to make that book, Amanda, I literally cut through the wrong spot. I couldn't, but you look like you're a, a crafty person by nature and you got all those cuts right, mostly because Marion was leading you through it so beautifully. Katrina, I'm just going to put you on the spot because I think you're fabulous. Um, any thoughts, reflections? Um, I am dressed in toque and very casual today because of various reasons, but this was delightful. And I had, um, I remember, so first of all, thank you for this book thing because um, I have two little ones in my home who we will be making a plethora of these. <laughs> this will be a permanent. Um, and I, I was delighted by all of the stories shared. I'm delighted by this writing activity um, as a very untrained poet, because uh, I write poetry a lot. I use a lot of poetry in my research, um, but I'm, I'm not trained. <laughs> I've never taken, never been formally taught. Um, so this was like, I think I want a, a new favorite writing activity as well. Um, I'm not gonna share my words because, um, They'll probably make me teary and I don't really want to do that right now, but it was very touching and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I, I just can't, um, Laura, especially as I was listening to your story, um, I, I too have mixed ancestry and I kind of walk in this way of seeing the world and feeling the world in one way, but also navigating it, looking another way and, um, and very deeply immersed as a nurse. I'm, I'm trained, I like all of my training sometimes, nursing is maybe perhaps in a way there's like a, a a deep relationality to our profession and I think that that um has been very comforting to me but it it almost replicates the tension in a different way my my tension page was very tense <laughs> I, I drew like a uh there's a lot of of pressure on that paper <laughs> and um I think that yeah these tensions are 
are really big, but I also think that I love how this shows how beautiful allowing ourselves to sit in those moments of tension and experience them and be open um, to them. Because I think um, in my current opinion about the world and what's going on in it, we have an awful lot of tension around us. We are, we are in this country walking with intense tension. Um, and some of the rural urban divides uh, in our country are amplifying tensions. And I actually think the thing that makes my heart hurt the most when I think about um, events and tense events over the last couple of weeks has been mostly seeing people living a space of divisiveness and not recognizing how much um, connectedness we actually have. And that um, these very intense feelings people are experiencing are very shared in how we might be expressing them or how they're manifesting may be different. But um, I, I hope that in these spaces of tension, moments of something beautiful that invites people to feel connected with their hearts and see through some of those tensions, what might be possible um, is helpful. And I think whether it's in health systems or the health and healing professions, or whether it's in our broader world, I think, um, art has always played a really important and provocative role in making that possible. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity and um, on many levels, like very practically as an artist and a poet and as a mother uh, whose children enjoy crafts. <laughs> um, on many levels, I'm very grateful for this. So thank you for it today. Katrina, thanks so much. Pamela, thanks for um for all of the work that you're you're sharing in the chat. It's remarkably important. Um, I'm scrolling through the screens right now just to see if uh, there's any participants that I know by name that I might be able to um, call on. Um, I know Leslie Bryant, you're out there. If you wanted to share, we'd love it. And of course, uh, I know you, Stephen. So, you know, if you have any desires to turn your um, camera on, we have three minutes. And I know people love to see each other in these environments and do a little bit of sharing. But again, there's no, there's no huge pressure. Um, I'm just scrolling through names that I know well. An apology if I've missed your name and you're my very best friend, I'm sorry. It's because I'm worried about the dog somewhere in the background. Hi, Sarah, I think we should get the dogs out together there. Right, yes, so Leslie and I live down the street from each other. Hi, Leslie, Zoot and Piper can go nuts together. Yes. Um, but yes, do you have anything to share, Leslie? Um, I, uh... I agree with what Katrina has been saying and um, just some of the experiences I've been having recently. I, uh, I did get COVID and I was sick for well over a month, uh, even though I was vaccinated and, um, and had a lot of like anger and other issues, like other feelings about that. So I was like, I did my part. I got vaccinated. What the heck's going on? But then I thought, you know, if I hadn't got vaccinated, I'd probably be dead. I don't know. Um, so I, where, what I loved about today, and thank you all for sharing. And um, Laura, I too, like completely um, have vulnerability hangovers the next day. And so I was right there with you. I'm like, embrace it. It's perfect. I, your stories were, were wonderful. Um, I think of uh, Katrina, your work with Taba, and um, uh, we, I'm on a group from TRU where we did some work with our Indigenous employees from Interior Health, and we had the same findings as the Implant Site Report, and I felt like your presentation today, Sarah, wrapped it all together for me from a, like, this is the healing way forward. Uh, so we've kind of like opened all these wounds and this is like a beautiful way to move forward. So I'd love to connect with you on that side of, of healing knowledge translation or some like uh, trying to take this um, hard news and but moving it forward in a more um, healthy way. Is, is that the right way to say it? Yeah. 
So thank you so much for sharing. We can do it while walking dogs, Leslie. Right? That'd yeah. be awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Kim, I I we are sticklers for time. We love to respect people's time. Um, we promised you we'd uh be yarded off stage at exactly 10 30. We are there. So I'm gonna put this back in your hands to lead us through the rest. And just a huge thank you, Marion, Laura, Lisa. You know how terribly I swear all the time. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bring my Haida Gwaii logging camp Port Clements language into this, but you were bleepity bleep bleep amazing today. Thank you so much. You were incredible. Um, Kim, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Marion, and Laura for being here today, for the stories shared, and for the engaging and creative way to collectively and individually explore thinking about different ways of being and knowing. To Lisa for sharing the slides, of course, and being the, the tech support in the background. And we thank you all very, very much. Uh, so 10.31, we'd like to offer everyone a 10 minute break at this time to boil water for tea or pour yourself a cup of coffee, get yourself a glass of water so that we can come back again together uh, for our next session, which we've simply titled, Share a Cup of Coffee or Tea, where we'll also be facilitating a buzz group session and have a question to explore in small groups and then come back together as a collective. So I'll see you back here in 10 minutes, which will be at 11.32 a.m. I'll put that in the chat. So I'll see you back here at 11.32. Thanks again, everyone. Apologies, 1042, 1042. I think I said 1142, yeah. 1042. <laughs>